Okay, we're going to continue this uh, video, little video journey and story into racing and how the progression of the racing and riding years and that. The last one, the last video, the very first one in the beginning years takes, takes you up to how we even got to this point uh, to begin with, how we got to racing and that. And I'll just give a very quick review there on the how we got there is through my cousin Kip Ray. Uh, was racing this would have been in the around 1974 my brother decided he was going to race and then by the end of that week I decided I was doing it and another friend of ours Butch Marsteller as well so we all headed to a track uh, my parents took us up to the track in uh, towards Waterford PA I believe it was called J&D Motocross Park this particular bike here was a 1974 MX100. Uh, probably had about a whole four inches of travel on it. Two shocks on the back. Uh, steel swing arm. Uh, but it was the, the newest bike out at the time. So anyway, got a 1974 MX100 Yamaha. I believe we purchased this one. There was a place right over the Ohio line out of the city of Sharon. I believe it's called J&D cycles possibly something like that uh, it was just down over the hill i think it was Majory, ohio somewhere in there on the other side of the pa ohio line there's another rider out of there called tom klaus which tom was a pretty good rider i believe he was probably riding in the a class at that time uh, and there was a few other riders from down around the hermitage sharon area there uh, jeff bonus airs Ron Heben, a few other guys in that also riding from that area. So anyway, that's where I got the bike. It was down there. Uh, again, a 74 MX100 Yamaha. And we'll continue over here to a lot of different photographs from that time era. So 1974, so we go up to... Uh, J&D Motorcycle Park to race, find out it's an AMA sanctioned event and the AMA is a sanctioning organization of motorcycle uh, events in that which the organization has been around for many years I believe clear back in the early 1900s even though motocross really never got here until in the 1960s but they picked up then on the off-road racing and started to sanction and write the rules and regulations for that very very early on when they first come to the US with motocross so anyway this here was my very first we had to sign up uh, this here is my original sign up from the AMA I believe it was on uh, 7 which would have been July of 1974 entered in the 100 class 100 CC class uh, I don't know that they ha actually separated them at that time because I see it's just marked AM, so it's probably 100 amateur class. I don't believe they actually even had a, you know, an A class for the hundreds at that time. But the class structure was a little different in '74 than it is now. It if, like the 175 class no longer exists. Uh, so the structure was a little different. But this here was from 1974 July. That was my very first AMA card and registration. I see now that that back then it was actually ten dollars uh, to join the AMA, which at that time probably seemed like a lot of money. Because like back then I remember that that bike probably sold for I'm going to guess somewhere around six hundred dollars for a brand new bike. I mean the price of the bikes were a lot less back then than they are today. These are just some of the AMA cards over the year. I continued as an AMA member from 1974. Uh, clear up through until after your 25 years of service, you're then granted a, uh, it's a charter life member of the AMA where you no longer have to pay or anything. You're just granted in a considered a lifetime member. So for the remainder of your life now, you are a member of the AMA. 
There's other organizations in that that later we had to join, such as the District 5, CRA, and different ones like that. So, moving on, 1974, this would have been the bike. And after doing that for, I'm going to say, 74, 75, 76, and 77, for four more years, we would go to the races periodically. I would call it very sporadic. We might do maybe four races in an entire year. The highest would be maybe six. Uh, but I'd say probably average of maybe four races out of an entire year. So for, like I said, 74, 75, and 76, we did do some racing, but they were very uh, sporadic here and there. This was probably a picture from a track called uh, Freedom Acres, which is down closer to Butler, an old strip mine area. Most of these tracks are long gone, no longer exist. There's an old strip mine down there. And I'm sure this photo here was from at Freedom Acres. You could go down there during the week and ride as well, which occasionally we would. You can see the strip mine area in the background in that. And just as a kind of a side note to go along with this, I'll go on over. In pulling out some of this information, I found some uh, just old papers. I used to keep some records of stuff phone registries and stuff, so I just kind of found this a little interesting too. In it, so I had in there listed, because a little later in years in that there, there was different organizations in that, uh, motorcycle dealerships in that. And you've seen this one here, it was called uh, Keystone Motocross. They're out of Beaver Falls down there, I believe it was George Quay started that. And they were a suspension company. Uh, this here was Clear back when they were in Beaver Falls, known as Keystone Motocross Works. Later, uh, which George did do my suspension in that, not on this bike, but in later years. But later, Keystone then becomes Pro Action Cycles, which most people today would know what they are. Uh, so going down through there, then you got uh, Tri City Recreation. They were a Yamaha dealer in Titusville, PA. Zanotti Motors down by Butler, another Yamaha dealership. And most of these you'd find are no longer even in existence over the years they've uh, went out of business. J and J Cycles. J and J was a Suzuki dealership down out of Grove City. John Ayers owned it. it. Originally, I believe it was, I think it was McClelland Cycles. And if I'm correct, uh, I believe John's wife, Lisa, I believe that may have been her father, not positive on that, but I think it may have been that had McClellan cycles. And then John, I think, took over from that. Uh, he married Lisa then later. And, but anyway, John owned J&J &J cycles, and there was also Craig Martin worked for John down there at the motorcycle shop at that time. Later, John started Gear Racewear. Uh, which they were selling motocross gear, pants, chest protectors, jerseys, all that kind of stuff, which later then he closed that up uh, and just calls it gear racewear. Now, they do all the promotional stuff. If you watch the motocross nationals and events and that, uh, they do all the banners and stuff in that around the track. I believe John's still doing that. That was his company, Gear, and Craig went off. He bought out J&J &J then off of John, since he worked there. Eventually, then they moved to Mercer, and he had the dealership there. John then, or Craig Martin, ended up then closing that down in Mercer, and he went to work for Kawasaki later on. So th this is just the beginning years of some of these places as well, but most of them's all out of business now. But that just gives a little rundown on the history of that there. And then you go to uh, Fraley Cycles. They used to own the Suzuki dealership down in Newcastle. I just got to know them over the years too from at the races and that. Also closed down, no longer there. Uh, you can see 
Dave Coombs. This here would have probably, I'm sure this was Dave Coombs Sr., uh, who was a promoter, run High, High Point Raceway. In the beginning, it was, I believe, Appalachia Lake. But uh, he was one of the promoters in the area, and at times you'd get a hold of him for various things, whatever. So but I imagine that phone number is no longer in existence. That is now MX Sports, his son, Davey Coombs, and their one sister, I believe it's Carrie Jo, is running that today. Uh, so it just kind of shows some of the progression over the years from... This was many, many years ago uh, that a lot of these places were in business. And I, I had rode Yamahas over my entire life, really. That was primarily the bike. That's why I have a lot of these different dealers in that, because at times back then the bike, bikes broke quite a little bit. And you'd be calling around trying to find the different parts in that form at the different dealers to get them to keep you going. So we'll go back and we're just going to go through some photos in that from this time period. Again, that's my 1974 MX100. Over here, that was back at Freedom Acres Motocross Track. There, another one from Freedom Acres. This one here was from that very first race, J&D Motocross Park. Motocross at that point in time was quite a bit different than how it is today. I mean, you didn't have the official gear. Things were, a lot of the bikes were just Enduros. Uh, they weren't nearly developed like they are today. But what was different is they used to get huge turnouts. From back then, 74, up, I know in 78, up to the mid-80s anyway, we were very involved in racing. You would go to the races, and it was not uncommon, say, if you had, the, even the, the 125C class used to be a split class. They would commonly have 60, 70 bikes in that class. Your A class is 125, 250, and open A. The 125A, 250A, uh, those two classes used to be almost full gates at a lot of the time today you go to the races local races and that and they're lucky if they have seven in the a class but back then uh, the the number of riders and the talent level that was around was uh, quite different than today i mean you had a lot of very uh, fast guys back then This one here is J&D Motocross Park. You can see how many bikes are. That, that's the 100 class right there. That's the starting line. They used to do these rubber band starts. I believe it was like surgical cord or something. And they were just the three posts, one in the center, one on each side. So what you're seeing there is only halfway across that line. They would line up. An average gate was 40 bikes to a gate. And they'd stretch them rubber bands clear out to the center post. And then there was a pin just went down through the band and then they would when it was getting ready to go They would pull that pin and the rubber band would fly back and that was the start You can see this here. They didn't have very good dust control back then <laughs> In fact, they probably didn't hardly have any dust control So things would be very dusty if you got a bad start You could hardly see to even see the track to keep going. So it's pretty important that you got a good start uh, but Back then, uh, I guess at that point in time, I wasn't really in the contention for winning at all. This was my cousin, Kip. He's the one that really got us started on all this. That was also at J&D, Motocross Park. He's on 175 there. This here was back at Freedom Acres. You can see the Strip mine in the back. It was probably just the day we went down there practicing because you don't see many other bikes around. Back to J&D Motocross Park. Here at that time you would, part of the track was out in this field. You turned, you went up through the woods into another field in the back. Uh, there was one section, you come down a hill through the creek. They would run you right through creeks and streams at that point in time. Uh, there was none of the EPA and regulations like it is today. So they would actually take you right through streams on the motocross track and back out. 
So these are just some pictures from back then. This is back down there at uh, Freedom Acres. You can see the sign up building there in the background. See my mother on the bike and my brother in the background. That was Butch Marsteller, a real good friend of ours. It uh, raced quite a little bit. Butch was kind of a wild rider. I, I'll have to go off on some of the stories a little later on him and that, but uh, later Butch had a tragic street bike accident and was killed. He's 30 years old at the time. That was a CZ that he had. Old CZ, 250. It was myself, my brother, and Ed Richter. Uh, Ed and his brothers lived by us and later moved out to Arizona. Just some riding in the yard. This is another motocross track, uh, not sure where. Just riding in the yard, another motocross track. These are just some old photos from back how the motocross tracks and that used to be. Uh, some of these here were just more trail riding ones. Not sure where this motocross track was here. Whoever took the picture only got the front wheel. And this one here was probably back down at Freedom Acres. Like I said, them, the first four years of racing was very limited. And primarily we only did J&D and uh, Freedom Acres. Both tracks have been long gone. You can see also back then they used to use tires. They would put tires and outline the track. That's how they formed the track. They would just put tires around and outline the track in tires. They don't tend to do that so much today. So these are real old school motocross. Rubber band starts, tires outlining them. A lot of natural terrain, but you can see they were very dusty. No water control. And a little story on that there. Back at that time period, on that 100, uh, you used to wear, actually carry a toolkit right with you during the race. So you'd have to carry, the, they were uh, prone to fouling spark plugs. So you got any water on the cap and that, they would foul out a plug and just quit on you for various reasons. So would actually wear a little tool pouch, like a fanny pack, carry an extra spark plug with you. And it was not uncommon in the middle of the race, I would be stopped having to change a spark plug in the middle of the race. but uh, So during them four years, a lot of time I'd be getting lapped. Uh, my results were not all that good. I, needless to say, I never trophied during those four years. It was just racing for the fun of it. Just enjoyed racing and going and being part of it, but the results were never there for those four years. Uh, so... The big change comes about. So the year 1978. New bikes come out around Thanksgiving, so it would have been 1977, when the new models are released, and that's usually whenever we'd get our new bikes, would be right around Thanksgiving. So 1977 comes about, and I get a brand new YZ100. This here was when they went to the mono shocks. This here, they put it in the parents basement kept it down there uh, at that time I run the number 10 I also forgot that I even run number 10 during some of the earlier years there because uh, later I'd seen some pictures and forgot all about that and didn't even realize that that was me on, on the number 10 but second bike there was a friend of mine's Rick Amos I'm down by Stoneburg he had a 125. He'd also got one that year. So this was at my parents right here. Their Outback Garage, which later become like my little race shop. Uh, fixed it into a complete race shop for the bikes and that. 
So the year is 1978, got the bike in 77, and this year must have been in the spring when we were starting to get the bikes out. You didn't ride much in the winter back then. We used to get quite a bit of snow. This is outside the garage, which was the race shop. That had an old three-rail bike trailer. I believe I bought that off Kenny Bath. And that was just me painting it in the garage. Uh, probably just brush paint and it was some paint in that. There's the bike trailer behind the Chevy pickup that my parents had. I, I was only 15 years old at that time, so didn't have a driver's license. So at the beginning then of 78, which I wouldn't have got my license until May. Uh, I guess I got another little story to go along with that that year, which I'll get into later. But that's how it would go to the races. We had the three-rail bike trailer <clears throat> towed behind their Chevy pickup with the cap on it. This was inside the race shop, my parents, <coughs> in the back of the garage. Just a crude workbench. Uh, it was an in, indoor garage there. That's where we worked on the bikes out there. Uh, I believe it was sitting on an old Honda 90 there that was in there too, a friend of ours, Bill Seddens. Got the bikes, then in 78, got Phil's Yamaha, had opened in Greenville. He used to deal out of just a small garage, primarily snowmobiles, up by his house. But then he owned, opened a shop there in Greenville, PA. And uh, so I rode out of Phil's Yamaha in Greenville, PA. And this here was, here's his son, Billy, on the left. There's a number of guys across there that uh, got bikes out of Phil's and that and raced out of there. And I guess I would be the second from the right back. And that's Denny Gibb on the far right and me there. So some of the different tracks we're going to. This one here would have been at, I believe that was Mercer Racetrack called Hughes. Used to have a, a ravine that you went down in on one side and jumped out of the other side. The next one over, this here would be, again, 1978 at a place called Harbor Woods, Pirate Motocross in Newcastle, PA. It was Musquires, which it would be Leland's father, and I believe it maybe it was his uncle. It was kind of a family-run track. His grandfather and different ones uh, worked there doing different positions, like running the starting gate, different things like that. But a story to go along with this picture that I'm not 100% sure is correct, but I believe, believe that it is. It was either the kid in the very center with the 43, or the next one over with the Fox jersey on. Uh, and I believe I was right there behind them. In 78, uh, I was running the 100 C class. This was the first year that since I had a decent bike and things really turned around this year. Because primarily I would did quite won quite a few races. But I do remember one of those two. I don't remember which one it was, but I believe his name was maybe Dean Hepler, which I believe is the father of Brock Hepler. They were from down around Contanning area, somewhere in there, or maybe it was even his uncle. But Brock later then, uh, I believe, rode for Team Suzuki. With Had some fair results in that, but again, I believe that's his father or uncle there in that picture. This here is back at uh, Harbor Woods, Newcastle. Harbor Woods. This is the start at Harbor Woods, more of Harbor Woods. This is the starting line. They still had a rubber band start at that time, 1978. Harbor Woods getting staged for the start of that. I believe Harbor Woods. This one here was probably at either at Mercer or at Stomber, not sure which.
back to Harbor Woods. This one here is back at Hughes in Mercer. That, I believe, was at Harbor Woods, for sure Harbor Woods. The, uh, a lot of these were from at Harbor Woods. We run there a lot that year. I wish I had a better picture of this. They had, this was right at the finish line, the checker, and they had three jumps there in a row. And at the beginning of that year, everybody would single and single, and then there's a rider. Matt Manfredi, he started to double the first two. And then uh, double and then single off the third one. And at that time, that was a big deal. And later in years, I went back down there. They also had a set of doubles in the back that was a very big set of doubles at that time. You'd have to get a full run from the bottom of this little bit of a hill to even make them doubles. Later in years I went back down, many years after they had closed up and walked back in there, the place is all growed up and brush and everything, but the doubles are still there. And when you look at them, the doubles were actually probably something you could, now you could turn almost 20 feet before the base and clear them pretty easy on the newer bikes. This here is at Stomber. This was their announcing booth at Stomber, just the bed of an old pickup truck. This is Tim Marsteller at Harbor Woods. Apparently Tim crashed out. He was riding a bull taco at the time. This was a practice track I had right in my grandparents' field, right behind my parents' house. Uh, which would be, you can see the A-frame building of Vacation Land Campground down in the bottom there, and Fergie's Bait would be right down off the other part. Some of these pictures are, you can see the amount of smoke in that, even off the motorcycles, at the starting line back then. So his must have won two trophies that weekend, I believe. Yeah, that was probably the weekend. One of the weekends, Rick Amos let me run his 125. So I run 100 and 120, 125 class that weekend. <clears throat> this picture right here was at Hughes, also 1978 top of a big downhill. I believe the riders in that picture was probably Jeff Bonasairs, I believe is how you pronounce his name, was on the Honda. Right behind him on the Yamaha in the blue jersey was Ron Heben, which Ron Heben then later become Kawasaki's team manager. I believe he was the team manager for a number of years for factory racing team Kawasaki. Uh, moved to California and was in with the factories out there and it was probably in the yellow and black right behind them was probably Mike Misco. Mike was from down around Newcastle. Uh, we kind of become friends later on in that during the Harbor year, Harbor Woods years down there in 78, 79, 80 and that. We used to, Mike was just around a lot. We used to do a lot of different things in that. Uh, the night before the races and that so it's just got some stories to go along with that as well which I'll probably get into later on so the year 1978 I turned I was 15 years old gonna turn 16 in May turn 16 May 19th uh, High Point Raceway every year held the Pro Nationals They'd already went from Appalachia Lake. Now it's over at High Point. It's the weekend of the Pro Nationals. I get my driver's license, or I turn 16, say, on a Monday, go down, take my test, and me and Tim Marsteller decide we're leaving for High Point that weekend. So I only had my driver's license for less than a week. 
me and him load up the pickup and the uh, three-wheel bike trailer and take off for High Point, going racing down there. That's the weekend of the Pro Nationals. So this would have been 1978. This is Marty Smith, which I'm sure anybody that knows anything about racing would know who Marty is. He was factory Honda. He was one of the original superstars of racing. Uh, kind of shows how, how he was he was racing. They had a, just an enclosed trailer and an old motor home they traveled out of. Don't remember that's a mechanic. The guy sitting there was uh, Marty's mechanic at the time. I believe he stayed with Honda for quite a few years after that. Don't really remember what his name was. Uh, but that's Marty Smith and his mechanic there at High Point. There's Marty out on the racetrack. Probably Marty there too. That's Marty. He was a national number one. Carried the number one plate that year in the pro class. There's Marty with his mother. Uh, right at the back of their trailer and that. That's Marty Smith's mother and Marty. Marty and his wife, Nancy, that he married both. This, right now, this year is 2024. I believe it was probably in about 2022. Marty and Nancy were both killed in a dune buggy accident uh, out in the desert. So tragic ending to that. But Marty, one of the very first of the national champs here in the U.S. in motocross. Again, this was in 78. So motocross is still relatively new. I believe this is Tony DiStefano, Pennsylvania rider. Tony went on later to win a national championship himself. Maybe a few, actually. Don't really recall. But again, this is the weekend of the Pro Nationals at High Point. If you've seen that event today, uh, how the banners, the setup in that is far different. Back then, you, you would actually walk right out. You could cross the track while the pros were. During the race, you could cross the track. You could get right out at the edge. Of the track you can actually see see how people are so close to the track there's no fencing no nothing still had the tires to outline the track they painted theirs white uh, but that's the original years of motocross i believe this is uh danny Layport, team suzuki even back then they traveled kind of got around on their own a lot those that they did have some box trucks i think danny had a box truck then back then kind of like similar like your say ups fedex truck just the dual wheels and that with a box on it they traveled and raced out of them you know or marty like out of an enclosed trailer and an old motor home so again High Point Nationals, 1978, Pro Nationals. Over here, got the little arrow to him. That's Keith McCartney, who was uh, Bob Hanna, Bob Hanna's mechanic. Uh, I believe this is Pierre Carsmaker forget which country he was from. He's not from the United States. He was over here racing. Marty Tripes. Uh, that was myself, but that was that's not at High Point. I'm not sure where that was at. At another racetrack. Here was one. I believe this here was at Stoneber. The Stoneber Fairgrounds. They used to have a motocross track. Kenny Vath used to do it, but uh, we would race there. Another one from Harbor Woods. This was the back doubles at Harbor Woods as well, clearing the doubles on my 100. I believe the guy there with the 
Got the black sleeve with the yellow stripe was maybe Dean McRae's father. Uh, if I remember, I got a little bit of stories to go along with that, but that was me over the back doubles. Back then, that was before the big whips and everything like you do today. That was somewhat of a, the beginnings of a cross-up. I mean, to do a cross-up back then was a big deal. That was when uh, the one-handed jumps and taking one leg off the foot peg and all that or clapping your hands above your head, taking a hand off the handlebar. It was kind of like uh, show riding back then before freestyle ever come about. This one here had to be back at Stomber. And in back at Harbor Woods. Um, so, like I said, before 1978, the prior four years, I was getting lapped, never had no results in that. So, by the end of 1978, I was starting to have some pretty good results. So, I used to keep almost like a little ledger in that, which is very nice now because I went coming back through this ledger when I got out the other day, I realized some of the stuff I don't even really remember is how it happened or how it all turned around. But when you see it, you know, it was all noted back then. This here was just in an old student notebook that had Yamaha YZ100 on, but I would have still been in uh, 78. I would have been maybe a sophomore in high school at that time. 15 years old turning 16 that year. So first race of the year was at this Harbor Woods. And first moto, I got a sixth and then a fourth. Got a fourth overall. No trophy. But the second race of the year, from going from being lapped and stuff the prior years, first moto, I had a fifth. Second moto, I had a second. And I had a third overall. Got a third place trophy. I say I grabbed the whole shot in both those motos. But I had wrecked in the first moto there. I got the little wrecked and make little notations of what happened. But that third place overall, that was the very first trophy I had ever won, ever. That would have been the 100C class that year. So then we go on to Hughes Motocross, which would have been in Mercer. And had a sixth and eighth. And back to Newcastle, a fourth and a second, second overall. Then we started doing was, uh, Wattsburg Fairgrounds. They had night races up there. See, on May 12th, we went up did a night race. Ended up with a second overall. Most of these finishes now, when you're in the top five, typically back then, because they had big classes, you would be trophying. So things had started to really turn around for me really quickly. So we go back to the Wattsburg again, May 19th. That would have been my birthday. Friday night had a fourth overall, uh, fourth place trophy. Back then to Pirate had a second overall. Back to Stomber had a fourth overall. Back to Newcastle. This here was probably my very first first overall uh, that I got. First time I ever won it took an overall win. It had to be then. June 4th 1978. So again, things had really turned around rapidly in 78 for me. Just getting on a decent bike before the old bike always broke on you in the middle of the races and stuff. So made a big difference. I can also see this was the weekend I raced. Uh, Rick Amos let me race his 125. So I uh, raced it and I got the whole shot on it. And I'm showing I got a Second overall in the 125 class. That was probably from that one picture where I'm holding the two trophies there. Run the 100 in the 125 class and the 125 both classes. So back to Newcastle, end up second overall. Back to Mercer here, third overall. 
uh, Lawrence County Farm Show or Fairgrounds. They uh, not farm show. That's a whole nother place. But Lawrence County, they started doing Friday night races. They held it was called a Pepsi Cola Super Series, and not sure. Apparently, they didn't have a hundred class there. They may not have. Because I see I run the 125B class there. Probably did it on my 100. Uh, at an 11th overall. I don't know why else I'd be in the 125B class. and Because I was riding 100 that year. So I'm just making an assumption of that. But that's why I run the 125 class. So then back to Harbor Woods there. Won both motos. First overall. Then we go to July 9th. That must have been the High Point weekend when me and Tim Marsteller took off and went to High Point. That was the 250-500 Nationals. Didn't remember it was a 250-125 or what, but 250-500 Pro Nationals. Uh, so anyway, that weekend down there ended up with an 11th overall. No trophy there. So... July 16th, we go back to Newcastle to Harbor Woods. Won both motos, first and first, first overall. Back to Lawrence County. And not sure what happened here, but, uh, oh, it says caught in the gate. Terrible weekend. I had a 16th and a 13th. Uh, not sure what happened that weekend, but that was not a good weekend, apparently. So back to Stoneburg. See, I got a fourth overall. Back to Wattsburg Fairgrounds, second overall. Back to Harbor Woods, second overall. Uh, and then I guess it shows moved up to the B class. So now I'm Moving out of the uh, 100C class, again, up until that year, beginning of 78, I was getting lapped in that. So beginning of 78, you know, I'm signing up. I got 100, so I'm signing up C class, which is basically the novice class because uh, I had never trophied. And then things really started to turn around for me that year. Because primarily, usually I have found until you... Once you're winning all the time in the lower class, and then you can move up to the next class up, which they would go A, B, and C for the rankings, which primarily C is your, supposed to be your beginner class, uh, novice. B would be your intermediate or B class after you got some experience, but B class could be very competitive. Uh, and then if you're winning all the time having good results in there, then you would move up to the A class or some call it pro class. But basically in racing, you got A, B, and C. Your A class is your pro class, or if you got to hold a pro license, you're running the A class. The difference between like the nationals, those are the pro nationals. Those are, uh, you have to hold a pro card, which is still the A riders. You just have to apply for and get an, a pro license to be able to run in the pro nationals. And it's designated uh, for pros only or a lot of the guys you see trying to make the cut and all that uh, are your A riders from the local tracks and that. That's, that's how it's made up. A, B, and C with the A, B, and your ranks of the pros. So anyway... Still in 78, I go to Wattsburg Fairgrounds on a Friday night. And I see I got a notation here of I raced a 250 CR that night. Not sure why I was on a 250. I'm assuming my bike must have been broke down, which that would happen. And can't remember his name. It was Richard something, lived over by Jackson Center. And I do remember he let me use his bike for that weekend. And he had a 250CR, and that, that's what I got to assume that one was from. Not positive, but uh, so I run the 250 class that night and had a uh, sixth overall in the 250 class. So then we go 
back to Wattsburg the following week. You can see I ruined the front rim uh, that night at a sixth and seventh. Must have bent the rim in on something. It wasn't uncommon, you'd ruin rims back then. Several a year anyway. Uh, back to Newcastle at a fourth overall. Back to Newcastle. Now this here would have been, I've already moved up to the B class now. Third overall. Back to Newcastle. Got a first, got hole shot at both motos. Got a second overall. Then back to Newcastle. Uh, third overall, back to Newcastle, third overall, back to Newcastle, a second overall. So now even in the B ranks, the uh, results are picking up pretty rapidly in there. Uh, now towards the end of the year, back to Harbor Woods. See first moto erect, had a seventh, bent the handlebars and the front rim. In that... Uh, And I believe that was the uh, conclusion. So by the end of Harbor Woods that year, what they had done is uh, whenever you signed up, at the beginning of the year when we walked in their sign-up building, they had this large trophy up there. And I remember Tim Marsteller was along or whatever, and we walked in there and uh, seen that trophy. And you got to imagine, at 15 years old, that was pretty exciting had no idea that by the end of the year uh, I would actually win the overall championship therefore at the track and what that was is they combined all classes it didn't matter what class you were racing uh, every class across the board A B and C from the hundred up through to the open class in A B and C ranks you just got depending on how many bikes were in your class and what place you got you got scored so many points and it was accumulation of the points over the year. So they had, there would have been a lot of entries over that year, probably. Uh, I'm guessing there, there had to be well over a thousand different entries come in there. Now, true, some of them, you know, they might have come and raced there a couple of times and didn't come back. But a lot of them come pretty regularly. And uh, at the end of the year, it was whoever accumulated the most points out of any class was going to be the overall winner. And... Uh, so at the end of 78, I had won that overall trophy. And I believe the, the final race that year that was coming down, it was going to be between, as I recall, there was between me and I believe maybe Sam Fodia. Sam Fodia was an A rider in the 125 class that had, uh, he was in contention. There was only a few that still in contention for that there, and I think it was my first moto, possibly. Uh, back then you wore an open face helmet. I had an old red, white, and blue with stars open face helmet. <laughs> Actually, there it, there it is in the picture. You can see you wore open face helmets with the Scott goggles with the lower face mask. At the beginning of the year, it was probably just the snap-on mouth cover. So your helmets weren't very good back then. They were pretty thin. Anyway, they had a Big set of doubles off to the one side, and uh, I don't know what happened, whether I come up short on them or whatever. had a really hard crash. Uh, smacked my head. That was probably the first possibly concussion I ever got because I remember it just seeing the bright lights flash and that when I cracked my head into the ground on that one. But I did get up, finish the race. I don't even remember what my results were that day. Uh, but in the end, I was able to uh, win the overall. In this, tro or in this picture here, that was just from that race year. It said an old box. It was like an old tin cupboard bolted on the trailer for car carrying gear and that. So that was the trophies over the, that year, 1978, from the different tracks, along with the high point overall trophy. And primarily at that time, we were mainly running, again, Harbor Woods, Mercer, which was Hughes, Wattsburg, 
Lawrence County and Stoneburg Fairgrounds. We hadn't really started to travel out much yet at that point in time. Uh, so that was the conclusion basically of 1978. So I'll probably conclude this video there or here pretty quickly. I, I would get to say this here then though that uh, through that and through that racing and that just uh, like at any of the races everybody knows who's winning, who the top guys are and all that there. So through that made a lot of friends, you know. Once you start winning in that, it just seems like, uh, shouldn't say it, but there gets to be a crowd, you know, like the ones who are winning kind of hang with the other ones like that for whatever reason. I mean, it seems kind of crazy in that, but at that time, it, that's kind of how it was. But then you start to get in with some of the other guys in that, uh, and Matt Manfredi, uh, Matt was a, one of the top A riders at that time. 250 class. Matt only lived over by Lake Latonk and that, so got to know Matt. Become friends with him and that. So would Matt would come over to my place, ride, he rode some at our practice track, and we went over to his place and rode. And that got to know like Mike Misco, another uh, he was a pro guy, held a pro license and that from Harbor Woods. You got to know a lot of the guys from back then and that during that year. And uh, so that all helped transition then coming into 1979, which then in 79, 80, 81, 82 would be kind of some big turnarounds for me coming in that. that uh, but this was all setting the stage kind of coming up to the following years and the people you got to know and meet over those years and that and the experiences and travel and that. So. I guess I will conclude this video.